Hello, we are now 13 weeks into the horror which has engulfed Gaza after the 7th of October and um, atrocities committed um, in Israel. Um, tens of thousands are dying violent deaths, but many, many more may well die of other causes, starvation, the collapse of the health system. Now, the question of genocide has hovered over the onslaught Israel has unleashed against Gaza. Um, many legal specialists, specialists in genocide, have been openly discussing this from nearly the beginning. But South Africa has now launched a case against Israel accusing it of genocide in the International Court of Justice, which is basically the UN's top legal court. Now, I already went through this case in detail in my last video, so do check that out. I tried to explain genocidal acts and genocidal intent as set out by that document, but I'm not a lawyer, um, so which is why I'm particularly delighted to be joined by the excellent Daniel McCover. He's our legal expert. He is a brilliant solicitor based um, in London, um, and he has he has a very different eye on this document because he's an expert, which I'm not. So, Daniel, it's a massive honour to be joined by you. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much, Owen. Uh, firstly, I'm really, really fascinated, actually, before we go into this, by your own background. It's actually very relevant, in fact, to what we're talking about, because you are uh, the son of Moshe Makover, who was an Israeli academic. Can you just tell me about him? And actually, there's a bit of context here, which actually is a good segue, I would say. Yes, thank you, Owen. So my both my parents were born in Palestine, as it then was, and uh, Israeli citizens who um, became very concerned about um, what was happening in Israel as they were growing up and into the 1950s. And then when the following the Six Day War, they were one of a, a relatively small number of Israelis who immediately opposed the, the fact of the occupation. Uh, and I'd just like to read you something that my father was a co-signatory to uh, with a very small number of Israelis, including a, a Palestinian citizen of Israel. Um, and this is what they said in a declaration that was published by Haaretz newspaper. Obviously, I'm reading you an English translation of the Hebrew. And this was on the 22nd of September, 1967. Our right to defend ourselves from extermination does not give us the right to oppress others. Occupation entails foreign rule. Foreign rule entails resistance. Resistance entails repression. Repression entails terror and counter-terror. The victims of terror are mostly innocent people. Holding on to the occupied territories will turn us into a nation of murderers and murder victims. Let us get out of the occupied territories immediately. Now, Owen, for me as a lawyer, um, following my parents' decision to, to leave Israel, about a year after that uh, statement was published, uh, a lawyer growing up here and, and very committed to the rule of law in domestic human rights cases that I've acted for in, in actions against the police and the prison service. For me, what this statement cries out for is for justice, is for the rule of law to be applied to the Palestinians and in particular their right to exercise their self-determination rights as, as, a, as a collective. And the failure of the international community, despite early resolutions following the Six-Day War, uh, Resolution 242 of the United Nations Security Council, etc., is now horrifically haunting us and has haunted us for decades. And it's now clear to me that the years of the failure to apply international law, and in particular to suppress um, alleged war crimes committed by Israelis during this long occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, has led us to where we are today with the most serious of allegations against uh, the Israeli state, which South Africa has brought, as you've said, to the International Court of Justice. Um, and it's a very, very sad day. It's a horrific situation that we've reached. And for Israel to face a claim of genocide just shows us the, how far we've gone and that it was all predicted um, in, in the clearest way. Okay. This shouldn't, in fact, ultimately come as a surprise, shocking as it is. I would say there was kind of chills down my spine listening to that. It was an incredibly prophetic 
statement. They've been vindicated in the worst possible way. Yeah. Um, and and it's interesting as well. You mentioned that because what the document that South Africa submitted does is try to put this in a historical context, pointing out that genocide, which was coined by a German Jewish um, uh, lawyer, I believe, in 1944. Oh, sorry, it was a Polish Pol Polish Jewish lawyer. Sorry, yes. in 1944. Um, was that genocide is it should be placed in a continuum. It wasn't simply an act in a vacuum that had a broader context, which it tries to place what's happening in. I just want to start with South Africa. Now, South Africa is a is a victim of apartheid, and I I think that that is the its own context for why it's submitting this. And um, it sees an affinity with the suffering of the Palestinians in terms of the context of what South Africa has endured. Um, but what's the legal basis for what it's actually doing here? Why does South Africa think it has a responsibility and what responsibilities is it asking of others? Well, I mean, the, the, it's not completely unique, but it's very, very unusual for a convention of this type, the Genocide Convention, the, the convention which is there to prevent and punish the crime of genocide. So that convention creates a positive duty to, to act on the risk that genocide is going to be committed. So there's a, it's kind of got an early alarm bell within the convention, pay, placing positive duties on all the signatories, regardless of whether they're involved in the conflict in which a genocide may take place, to take positive steps to prevent it. So once they're aware of the risk, and there's a clear statement by the court in a case uh, brought, brought by Bosnia against Serbia, which sets it out very well, and it's in the document, um, the minute you become aware as a state that there is a risk of genocide, you need to step in and take positive steps to prevent it. And South Africa sought to do that by various statements it made early on. And it included going to the International Criminal Court with four other states saying, look, what started in October now looks to us like a series of very significant alleged war crimes, crimes against humanity, and they mentioned genocide. And they asked the court to act. The ICC has not acted in a kind of timely fashion in response to that. That was back in November. And That's so the International Criminal Court. Yeah. Separate, a separate entity, which is much more recent. The ICJ goes back many, many decades, and there was a precursor to it under the League of Nations architecture, the precursor to the United Nations. Uh, and so that civil court has existed for a long, long time. The International Criminal Court is much newer. It came about due to the Rome Statute in, of 1998, which itself followed the need for having ad hoc criminal tribunals on events in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. So the international consensus to set up an international criminal court, sort of slightly outside the UN architecture, has to be said, that came about in the, in the late 90s and it's existed it came into force in the early 2000s. So it's existed for about 20 years, as opposed to the many decades of the International Court of Justice. So yes, that's correct. Um, so after it sent that document to the ICC, South Africa and four other countries in November, nothing much has happened at the ICC. There have been repeated attempts through the General Assembly resolutions and through trying to get strong resolutions at the Security Council. And South Africa have noted all of that and its failure to act on Israel to, to prevent the risk of genocide. And I think by the time we get to when they put in the document just a week or so ago, at the end of December, they have set out in ways that you've described in your earlier video so vividly and so clearly, strong evidence of both the index offenses relating to genocide and the necessary intent to destroy part of a national or religious or ethnic group. And that part of that group are the people who live, the Palestinians who live in Gaza, or over 1% of whom have already now died during these events. So the state we've reached as of the end of December is so serious that South Africa had to take the step, in my view, once it had alerted the world and Israel to its concerns, the logical thing to do. And it's really shameful that other states haven't joined it. All they can do now is support it publicly as Malaysia and um, Turkey have done in the last few days. As many as of the, of the 153 states that have 
party to the convention as possible need to come out and support what South Africa is doing. And I want to go back and answer in a legal term what you said. So the prevention of genocide is um, a jus cogens. Um, it's a fundamental international legal duty and right. Um, it, it, so it's a kind of pla a platform which is very unusual because it creates an international um, obligation, especially where it's breached. And at the point of breach, it creates what's called an erga omnis positive duty to act on it. So the Jus Kogan norms are the norm not to commit genocide, not to incite genocide. Everything around genocide is a fundamental um, legal uh, principle. Once it's breached or there's a risk of a breach, it creates a worldwide duty to act upon it. And that's what South Africa has acted on. Now, in South Africa's submission, I should say, and I, I, I pointed this out in my early video, they're not messing around. This is an extremely serious, detailed <clears throat> um, legal document with hundreds of references. It's unbelievably evidenced. Um, it is one of the most shocking documents I've ever read in my entire life. Um, I've been following, obviously, what I would regard as very blatant war crimes committed by Israel and statements of genocidal intent by prominent uh, leading Israelis, but I was still shocked to the core, if I'm honest. It was a chilling experience. Um, the, the two basically main components are conduct and intent, and it goes through allegations of genocidal conduct, and it makes the point there's a nuance. It, un it makes clear, look, we understand you. there are terrible crimes that can be committed that don't constitute genocide. Uh, so it makes that very clear. You can kill lots of people, that's not genocide. So it's trying to make it clear what genocide actually is. And it goes through everything from the, you know, onslaught against the public health system, preventing births, that kind of thing. But in terms of intent, I just want to talk to you about intent. The the, the list of genocidal statements being made by Israeli uh, government figures going to the top, the president, the prime minister, the prime minister being the most important there, the defense minister, but members of the cabinet, um, as well as Israeli army uh, leaders, as well as soldiers on the ground um, and army officers on the ground itself, uh, members of the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, um, and also the media, which is also extremely important. Now, I just want to be clear, because when I go through it, there's no question it's genocidal intent. I mean, whatever people say about genocide happening on the ground or not, it is incitement to genocide. I mean, it just there's no question when you read these statements. They're genocidal in intent, no question. Tell me about that in a criminal context, a legal context. Yes. Is that actually against the law? Is Israel just flagrantly breaking the law by not prosecuting people for inciting genocide? Yes, uh, the short answer. And and by the way, anyone committing that, that same offence, whether they're in Israel or not, uh, if they are signatories to the Genocide Convention, we signatories, Britain included, obviously had a, du a duty to in our domestic law create the relevant criminal offences to be able to prosecute incitement to commit genocide. And we've now learned that, in fact, before this South African case was launched, 15 very brave Israelis wrote to the attorney, the Israeli Attorney General, and I haven't yet seen an English translation of that letter, but it was just publicised uh, in the last couple of days that that letter went before they were aware of the South African case, they had no knowledge of it, requiring the Attorney General in an 11-page letter, and I'm assuming that in the section that you uh, set out yesterday, which is uh, paragraphs 100, 100 to about 107, which covers all of those incitement slash intent evidence, um, that the same, almost exactly the same, very likely maybe additional examples of incitement have been drawn to the attention of the Attorney General, and they've demanded that those acts of incitement are suppressed. And that is exactly what we, as an international community, should have been doing from day one. And frankly, I can only surmise from the silence of Western governments that they realised, going back to your earlier question, the moment you call out these acts of incitement and the evidence of intent, you have crossed the threshold where you have this duty I mentioned earlier, this erga omnis duty. You have to step out and do more than just call it out. Calling it out is the first and most important initial step. And it's been mentioned in several ICJ cases, by the way, Owen, that, that they said, look, in several cases, just 
saying stop it, stop inciting it, and requiring them to do it, and requiring them to suppress it through the criminal law, all acts of incitement, could in some cases be enough to discharge your duty. But we've gone well past that, I'm afraid. But that's the first thing all of us in civil society need to call on our governments to say to Israel, all of these acts, these brave 15 Israelis have pointed this out to you. You need to stop. You need to act on the criminal law and prosecute all acts of incitement. That's an absolutely necessary first step. And, and I just don't understand why our politicians haven't said this from day one, and why repeatedly states haven't. And as I say, it's difficult to see other than they are worried that they appreciate that once you begin to call this out, you need to do more. And the doing more is what they they feel they just can't or won't do for reasons which I don't have any, for me, any legal merit. I mean, on that as well, in terms of why it's so important that civil society does this, it, it strikes me what, 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 what I said, yes, in my previous video, is that this was Israeli society has become a kind of genocidal hothouse. And um, the document submitted by South Africa is a brilliant document, which is now out of date. Because yes. there's so much incitement going on. I counted yesterday four or five examples of incitement to genocide by, by yeah. leading Israelis. And One this is after they've had that letter that I mentioned. Exactly. After the letter submitted by these courageous Israelis. Um, so, for example, you had a member of the Israeli parliament went on national television and said everywhere he hears um, in, uh, across Israeli society is to kill all Gazans, to annihilate. He said exterminate or it depends on the translation, annihilate all Gazans, exterminate all Gazans. There was a debate amongst Hebrew speakers about the most accurate translation. In any case, it was mass, it was the, the killing of all Gazans. And that was on Indeed. national television. Clearly, and, clearly further um, dehumanizing, inciting comments made by leading Israeli politicians. And despite being told in that letter, but despite being told in this um, application to the International Court of Justice, nothing seems to have stopped them. And so as this document has, has pointed out later on, um, you didn't cover it yet, they, they, there's a glimpse into the future at paragraphs 136 to 143. What South Africa has drawn to everyone's attention and, and, and asking the court to look at is what is the risk to Palestinian life if this doesn't stop now, if you don't order Israel to stop its current actions in the Gaza Strip. And you pointed it out yesterday, but just have a glimpse into the future. We're looking at starvation. We're looking at many babies not being able to survive their first few days. We're looking at many mothers, pregnant mothers, not being able to make it through to the end of the term. We're looking at more and more children dying. We're looking at the squeezing of more and more Palestinians into tinier spaces. We're looking at further destruction of the infrastructure in northern Gaza. I mean, the, the amount of destruction we've seen so far, and Israel doesn't seem to be stopping. No. Um, and we've they publicly announced they're not stopping, but they're what they're doing. I mean, if you look at pictures, satellite pictures of northern Gaza, it, it, they've decimated northern Gaza, and they're continuing to do it. They, won't, they don't appear to, to be wanting to stop. And this is, by the way, I, I saw a, a clear announcement yesterday or the day before by a military leader uh, or maybe it was even the defense secretary saying we now are confident that in northern gaza there aren't opportunities for um, hamas or palestinian islamic jihad um, militants to come forward and attack us out of the blue we re we remove that risk so why are they continuing to destroy basic infrastructure and homes people's homes are continually and we see videos of israeli soldiers posted doing that so this won't stop owen unless well, yeah, exactly and, and that's unless we get. as we as we know 70 percent, as the document says um around 70 percent of all housing stock has been destroyed the idea yeah. that there's any targets of military value existing yeah. in gaza after an unprecedented uh, campaign of just what wiping out infrastructure is is, is obviously laughable. Um, D professor Devi Sridhar, the professor of public health at Edinburgh University, wrote an article pointing out that as things stand on this current trajectory, a quarter of the population will die in a year because of the collapse of the healthcare system alone. Um, in terms of what happens, though, in terms of what, because, you know, a legal case in the ICG itself, ICJ could go on for years, but they can issue provisional measures. So can you explain what that actually means? 
Yes. So, and they've done it in other cases, and they did it in the case brought by the, the Gambia against Myanmar, uh, another example of a case where a country not directly involved in relation to the events in, in Myanmar, in relation to the Rohingya, took it upon themselves to go to the ICJ and ask for a, a provisional measures order. And um, that's what South Africa have done here. And thankfully, the court has responded appropriately and listed a hearing to take place next Thursday and Friday, the 11th and 12th of January. And judging by past experience, we I really hope that they will then make a ruling in January. I hope it doesn't go into February. And what South Africa have said is, look, what we need to show you at this stage, we don't need to prove at this point that genocide has taken place. All we need to show you is that there's a, um, a plausible legal argument that genocide is taking place, a plausible legal argument, and allied to that, that there's a risk to the life of Palestinians as an entity, um, that genocidal acts could take place or continue to take place if the court doesn't take provisional measures, doesn't indicate provisional measures in the language of the application to Israel to cease what it's doing. And so it's a kind of two, two stage, well, it's really a three stage test. First of all, they have to show that they are, they've got standing to make this application, which I believe they will be able to show. Mm -hmm. Then they need to show that they have a plausible argument in relation to genocide. No more than that at this stage. It's, as you say, the actual case will go on for years. It's far too early for them to decide it. Have they, is, does this pass the test of plausibility? And in my view, again, because of these, this strong evidence and this strong evidence of intent, we're past that point. But it's at least plausible. That's all they need to show. And that's because on, that point, on the point about intent, before I ask you to, because I just want to ask you to what Israel's doing and what these judgments could, what, what emergency measures could actually mean in practice. When yes. I interviewed, as I mentioned, Razi Gal, who's a Israeli-American um, professor, uh, sorry, associate professor in genocide and Holocaust studies, and he said... Historically speaking, it's very rare for intent to be so explicitly spelled out. Normally what happens is states committing war crimes or genocide will cover it up. They'll put they'll they just they won't you won't have just r rampant intent on a daily basis. Yeah. So actually this that makes this case potentially quite unique because actually the, the examples of intent are so overwhelming and actually lack precedent. I agree. They're very strong. Uh, it's very strong evidence of intent. And, and the intent is matched by the actions here. And normally you have to go the other way. You have to look at the events, look at the underlying alleged criminality and say, can we infer, is there enough evidence to, to um, validly, uh, appropriately infer from the, the, the alleged criminal acts the relevant intent to destroy part or all of a national, ethnic, religious, etc. group? Um, here, I agree with you, the evidence of intent is remarkably strong and continues to be and has been drawn to the attention of the Israeli authorities by those brave Israelis um, in their letter a few days ago, but has been con con continually drawn to their attention, by the way, by a whole series of UN special rapporteurs and UN bodies, including the UN committee um, on the elimination of racial discrimination, CERD, as it's sometimes abbreviated to. So a whole series of international experts, lawyers, UN bodies have said there is a risk of genocide. We see evidence of genocide. We see evidence of the intent. And that's CERD in particular drew um, the world's attention in December to a whole series of evidence, which is in, again, in this um, application from South Africa. So yes, in short, very strong evidence of intent and so all of that's in front of the court there'll be this hearing and the question for the court will be if there's a plausible argument have we got have south africa convinced us that the risk to palestinian life in gaza is so urgent it needs such urgent uh, action that we will indicate provisional measures and that's what the ruling that we'll wait for, hopefully later in January. And Israel has chose to defend itself. Now, that's actually itself quite interesting because normally, I mean, they've lost ICJ rulings before and ignored them, and I'll come on to that as well. But um, they cho they've chosen to defend themselves. Does that show they're panicking? No, I think it shows that they realise that there's a need to address this and they've got no way of 
of ducking it. Mm -hmm. um, um, I think they have, they should be worried and they should be addressing this, but all of the bluster indicates to me that they still haven't addressed the reality of what their statements mean and what their actions indicate. And the legal case will hopefully change public perception because what Israel has failed, Israelis generally, and I'm not talking about their leadership, the current government, because they clearly are a very, um, in my view, dangerous uh, group of politicians. But, and, and despite still supporting the actions in Gaza, I, I, I fervently believe that a very significant number of Israelis have not looked in the mirror, have not actually read any of these um, series of um, actions and, and the impact it's having on Palestinian life in Gaza. And that I hope, I really hope that a case of this kind will, if the Israeli public are properly informed about it, yeah. um, will, will, requ will require some self-reflection. But in any event, this needs to be stopped in my view, by an order of provisional measures by the court. The, the brilliant um, Israeli journalist, Gideon Levy, who I interviewed, made the point that most of Israeli society are completely unaware, actually, of what's happening in Gaza, that the Israeli media is not even showing it. Um, just in terms of what the ruling means, though, because they ignore rulings. I mean, the ICJ will go, for example, great best case scenario, they will issue emergency um, um, measures, provis sorry, provisional measures, ordering Israel basically to stop its military actions and to make sure people in Gaza get humanitarian aid. So basically means to, to, to keep life. Um, so what, what will it actually mean? Why, why is this actually yeah. important? Well, I think the, the earlier rulings you have, have alluded to are advisory opinions brought um, on following resolutions by the General Assembly. There's, there's one in fact pending. Uh, the application uh, of the General Assembly asked the United, uh, the, sorry, the International Court of Justice um, earlier last year, and there's going to be a, an initial hearing on it in February to look at the legality of the occupation. And earlier in 2004, again, at a, the request of the General Assembly, the ICJ issued an advisory opinion on the legality of the, the separation wall um, being built by Israel in the West Bank. Now, it's true, Owen, that Israel has ignored what the court said in its advisory opinion. But this will be a binding order on Israel as a party to the Genocide Convention, under which Israel has agreed that it will be bound by rulings of the International Court of Justice in relation to its conduct when brought to that court. So this is a clearly um, uh, legal requirement for it to comply with the order. Now, whether or not it does, and it's already been reported on the Israeli press, there's some doubt being expressed uh, in Israel as to whether it would comply. But then we have a series of duties because what the court will have done is will it will have further um, highlighted, further embedded the legal duty I mentioned earlier, which I believe already exists uh, even before the court makes any order. But once the court makes the order, there's a domestic impact on everyone in all, certainly all signatories of the Genocide Convention, but I would say all countries will at that point been alerted. There's a plausible argument for genocide. They will, if, because that, that will have to be the finding. And there's a requirement, a legally binding order on Israel, which affects everyone. So anyone assisting Israel at that point will be in breach of, the, of that order, in my view, and of the convention. So there'll be opportunities for legal action of the kind the uh, Center for Constitutional Rights in, um, America's already taken against the Biden administration, but we could have worldwide litigation if states don't do what they should do, which is stop assisting Israel in any way whatsoever in breaching that order. So there will be legal ripples across the globe of any such order. And um, I, I appreciate Russia has not complied with the provisional measures that were ordered against it when Ukraine took the case. Um, and that's shameful and a breach of international law. We need to be supporting all actions to require Russia to comply with that order. But there are sanctions on Russia. Um, it's just that they haven't been effective yet in stopping Russia's actions. And Russia, as a permanent veto-holding member of the Security Council, can block all attempts through that avenue of enforcing an ICJ 
um, order. Israel isn't a permanent member of the Security Council. One would hope that the US administration would finally, if there's an order of the kind I mentioned, understand its positive legal duties and not veto a relevant resolution seeking the enforcement of the ICJ uh, mandatory order. So there are ways in which I would hope, and I believe there will be, a series of um, consequences for domestic legal systems and the international stage yeah. to require Israel to comply with that order. We've got to hope that, otherwise the international legal order is again being put under threat by the kind of actions that, in my view, a rogue state at that point, right. and I believe we've reached a position where Israel can be called a rogue state, but it will, it will put itself in a different league of rogue states if it then chooses to completely ignore um, this binding order. And I, I know we nearly, nearly finished because I've taken so much of your time and a huge legal expertise. I'm just wondering just to drill that down even a bit more. What could that mean, for example, in terms of arms sales to Israel? But one other example, because we've been talking about incitement, um, take, for example, I, I mentioned yesterday that I, I counted about four or five examples of, of uh, genocidal incitement intent. Um, and one of them was the Israeli ambassador to the United Kingdom, Zippy Hotevelli, who, when interviewed on LBC, said that every second home or whatever had access to a tunnel. Um, and then the presenter asked her, well, that, that just means wiping out everything in Gaza. And she said, well, what other option is there? Um, now, in theory, because a lot of people, including myself, said she should be expelled for genocidal um, incitement. I mean, she's a genocidal extremist. Um, do you think that actually, if these uh, provisional measures were passed, that could actually be an example where the UK government is actually, there's a legal obligation to act? Or do there is. In my view, there is already. What they should do now, let, let's not wait for the, the provisional measures order. Um, they should now say to the Israeli government, please lift her diplomatic immunity so we can prosecute her for incitement to commit genocide. And that, that can happen and should happen. And in the absence of that, we are we don't want to recognise, we're giving you notice, we don't recognise her as a diplomat anymore. We seek you to remove her from, from her role. That's, my, in my view, it would be a proportionate and appropriate step. And anyone, anyone in our country breaching the criminal law should be, un, or where there's an allegation, a plausible allegation, should be under criminal investigation because we have to suppress it's so important to suppress these um, acts of incitement to commit genocide. We owe it to ourselves as a country which upholds the rule of law to just recognise that these laws were put in place to prevent the oppression of vulnerable groups and peoples. If we're not doing that, what, what, what it really is the rule of law about? Just before I ask my very final question, I have to say, just taking a step back, this is extraordinary. The genocide convention we're talking about came because, above all else, because of the genocide committed against the Jewish people. I mean, that was, the, I know there were other genocides in World War II, the Roma, Roma, Serbs, and so on, but the principal, the most famous genocide, for all the worst reasons, the industrialized mass murder of European Jews, two thirds of whom were killed, murdered by the Nazis. And here we have the self proclaimed Jewish states facing measures against it from the very convention that emerged because of the genocide principally committed against the Jewish people. I mean, it's extraordinary. Yes, it's, it's uh, appalling. It's um, something I really thought, even with my concerns about the acts of Israel towards Palestinians and the fact of the crime against humanity in my clear view of apartheid, that we should end up with mass killing on this scale. Um, and as I say, I root it back to a fundamental failure by Israelis to, to look in the mirror and understand their positive duty to seek a way for Palestinians to be able to exercise their right to self-determination. That's at the root of all of this. We, we, we as, a, as a global community, Israel uh, and, and some of the, the leaders in the region and world leaders historically and currently, have just failed to grasp the fundamental issue, which is if you don't grant a people their right to self-determination, if you have a long-term occupation, terrible things will happen.
And just finally, you know, throughout this nightmare, which often feels, I have to say, like a deranged Black Mirror episode. I mean, I, I spoke to a prominent Palestinian activist who described this as the, the world's first ever live stream genocide. Um, what I think has struck me is the sense of impunity that Israel has. That's why you get genocidal intent being thrown around like confetti by leading members of the Israeli elite, because they think to themselves, nothing's going to happen. Nothing is going to happen. We are not going to suffer the fate of Slobodan Milosevic. We're not going to suffer the fate of other war criminals in the Balkan Wars of the 1990s. We can get away with essentially anything. We have the patronage of the world's last superpower. And the legal architecture of the world in practice is like a delicatessen where leading powers just pick and choose based on what acts they want to justify in a given day. It means nothing. And I just wonder, do you think there's ever any possibility that actually we could see Benjamin Netanyahu leading ministers, leading Israeli generals, soldiers on the ground who are just putting their war crimes on TikTok literally as fodder for public amusement? Because yeah. that's how much impunity they face. Could they ever, do you think, ever end up in a war crimes tribunal on the dock for what is currently being inflicted against the Palestinian people? Yes, in my view, where the evidence supports war crimes charges, crimes against humanity charges, genocide charges. I believe there is a day when some of these suspects will face court. And, and there are several reasons why I retain a hope that the rule of law will be upheld. And, and I was involved in, in cases seeking arrest warrants in this country. Those were judicial arrest warrants. The judiciary once presented, if they get the opportunity to be presented with the evidence, they will look at the evidence and properly assess what's going on. What we need to do is get these in front of courts so that the, the era of impunity comes to an end. And you know, we, we, we owe it that humanity requires that these laws are upheld because it's a terrible vista to think through the consequences of not holding people to account. So it has to happen. In my view, it will happen. It's only a matter of time. Well, I think that's a more hopeful ending than many of these videos and a very important place to end. Um, Daniel, that was absolutely fantastic. We do need to get the message out. Civil society, as Daniel said, is absolutely critical in what happens next. So make sure everyone's informed. Uh, I did the last video, of course, which went through the document that Daniel's put this in such an incredible legal context. Do like, subscribe, share this video. But Daniel, thank you so, so much for your work. It's absolutely invaluable. And I think you're playing an extremely important role in what's happening at the moment. Thank you, Anne.